Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the third lecture of the series on democracy and its discontents. A warm welcome to the speaker, Professor Danny Roderick, and to the many people who are uh, connected. I don't know how many, but we know that there were 650 people registered to connect. I am <coughs> Diego Gambetta, and I hold the chair in social sciences at the, here at the Collegio Carlo Alberto. The previous two lectures in this series were given by Adam Shevorsky and by Stephen Holmes in the autumn of 2019. And you can listen to them online <clears throat> on the Collegio website. When, when the series was conceived over two years ago, our concerns about the state of democracy were serious but not as serious and as urgent as they are today. Democracy was not in great shape, but the challenges were largely confined to the periphery among ex-communist countries with a sprinkle of populist parties raising their heads scattered in Western Europe. There were true disturbing noises coming from Trumpian US but could still be played down as a troubling but passing aberration. <clears throat> now matters, as everybody listening to this will know, have been changing quite dramatically. And uh, they've been changing in three ways. The first is that the populist boil has burst right at the core of the democratic systems. The US is the longest continuous democracy in the world. 220 years old, according to the World Economic Forum. They used to be a beacon for us all. The next in line in terms of democratic resilience is Switzerland, which counts at 171 years. And then New Zealand, 162, Canada, 152. So at least 50 years below the United States. So that, uh, uh, is quite a, a first uh, shock. And the fact that we didn't expect this is oddly enough uh, revealed by the fact that we are holding this lecture right in the inauguration of uh, Joe Biden, because we simply didn't expect this to be uh, such a, a tense and, and difficult and special moment. <clears throat> I mean, the next thing that uh, has happened is that the the boil has burst uh, in a very technical sense as a challenge to a fundamental of democracy. In, uh, you know, Adam Shevorsky as, as one of the foremost scholar of uh, democratic system has been stressing in his research, the fact that the most important thing about democracy, the element that qualifies it above all others is the ability to transfer power peacefully. That is, if the challenger wins a free and fair election over the incumbent, the challenger will uh, step into power and the incumbent will recede. The losing sides, I mean, one thing that uh, Adam Shevosky found founds close to miraculous is that the losing sides accept to take a step backward, regroup and aim to win at the next round. So the challenge to the results of the presidential election mounted by Mr. Trump and his supporters hits therefore right at the very core of democracy and threatens to subvert it. Smooth transfer of power is removed. We are left with no democracy. <clears throat> and when the challenge is laced with uh, threats and violence, our concern can only become heightened. Finally, the challenge to the quintessential mechanism of democracy does not come so much from the mob that assaulted the capital as, as it does by, by a large share of the elected representatives of one of the two main uh, parties in the US. It is a challenge that comes from within the system. I mean, none of, none of these things had happened in, in, in this form in any uh, democratic countries in recent times. 
And if you put them all together, <clears throat> uh, I'm, my white hair are already white, otherwise it, they would have become white. And maybe Giorgio's uh, will soon become even whiter. <clears throat> but be, you know, before people stopped me in the street and I said, why exactly are you having this series on democracy and its discontents? And now they stop me in the street and they complain that we don't have more such events. So what is to be done? <clears throat> I very much look forward to hear what Professor Roderick has to say about the rise of populism and possible remedies. One can hardly think of a more apt moment to receive his wisdom. And now I shall put my mask on, recede in the background and allow the president of the Collegio to come forward and introduce the speaker. Thank you very much, uh, Diego. Uh, I'm really honored. Uh, I'm Giorgio Barba Navaretti. I'm in fact the president of Il Collegio Carlo Alberto. Hello, Danny. I'm really very happy to welcome you with us. Actually, as I said, we would have loved to have you in person and uh, I hope you will be able to come when this uh, pandemic, pandemic crisis will be, let's hope soon over. Uh, but at least we can have you on the video. And uh, as Diego said, uh, your lecture couldn't be more timely. Uh, just a few words to introduce you to the, and introduce your lecture and then we'll give you the floor. Um, uh, Danny Roderick, uh, most of the audience uh, know who Danny Roderick is. Uh, he is a Ford Foundation Professor of International Political Economy at Harvard's Kennedy Schools of Government, and he's also the President-elect of the International Economic Association. But uh, on top of everything, I think uh, that uh, Danny is most of all a very deep and non-conventional thinker who has been able, I would say, to use and apply the most advanced methods of orthodox neoclassical, if you want, economic analysis, nonetheless continuously challenging the limits of this framework. And uh, on the back cover of one of his recent books, which is called Economic Rules, The Rights and Wrongs of the Small Science, 2015, it's written and he's defined as a leading critic from within the science that who renders a surprisingly upbeat judgment on economics, sifting through the failings of the disciplines, he, the discipline he homes in on its greatest strength, its many and often contradictory explanatory framework. I think that only a very, very deep and open mind can take such an in a difficult intellectual journey. So this is really what is the interesting approach of Danny. Danny has worked, uh, I mean, today we have a lecture on right-wing populism, but Danny has worked for a long time on the, the link between populism and democracy. And I think that uh, uh, a lot of his work, of this work on populism and democracy is really very much linked and rooted to his analysis of globalization. He wrote a seminal book in 1997 called Has Globalization Gone Too Far? Which was a very interesting book. And I think in, can, in his work, you can have, you know, three ingredients that explain the link between globalization and democracy somehow. The first is that somehow hyper globalization, as he calls it in many of his work, uh, and multilateralism move rules setting away from national democracies and national self-determination. This is the first uh, step. And essentially in a very prescient book that he wrote, which is called Glo The Globalization Paradox, he comes up with uh, a globalization trilemma. There are many trilemma in economics. Danny has the globalization trilemma, uh, whereby you cannot simultaneously pursue democracy, national self-determination and economic globalization. And so on this, there is a call for a need to move back from hyper-globalization to a shallower form of globalization where national democracies have a stronger role in defining rules and priorities for their citizens. But this trilemma is especially binding, and this is the second ingredient, when social tension rise. Of course, when social tension rise, somehow national self-determination tends to move away from the global agenda. 
And uh, this so happening where there are uh, large and growing cleavages uh, in terms of income, uh, but also in terms of cultural divide. I mean, Danny writes a lot about cultural the, the divides. Now, what is interesting and in that in his work, he relates also the growth in these cleavages to the growth of globalization. And so his analysis is very accurate in trying to understand how different trends in globalization or also maybe the, the role of globalization as very frequently a scapegoat of many problems and many crises uh, gener gradually give rise to also right-wing populist movements. Now, the problem, and here I come back to uh, democracy, is that right-wing populist movement in his very careful analysis, and especially in his last uh, recent work on the political economy of liberal democracy, which is a work that was published at, in the Economic Journal, uh, this rise is certainly creates growing difficulties and growing problems and growing risk for liberal democracies. He argues very thoroughly that liberal democracies rests essentially on three inextricable sets of rights, if you want, property rights, political rights, and civil rights. And that you know, somehow to, for these three rights to coexist and for democratic systems to coexist, uh, and to be sustainable, you need limited income, income inequality and also limited identity fractures. So as uh, Diego was saying before, uh, and if, even if you go through uh, the, the deep analysis of Dani, these are probably challenging and difficult moments for democracy. So really, I think that this is a very timely moment to, to discuss the rise of, of right-wing populism. And uh, now, um, I'm, I, so thank you very much, really, Danny, for having accepted our invitation. And I would say that the floor is yours and you can enlighten us with your thought and your presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, thank you, uh, Giorgio. Um, thank you, uh, Diego, uh, for the invitation. Uh, it, it's, it's very nice to be the guest of uh, Colegio Carlo Alberto in this uh, in this uh, virtual uh, uh, fashion. Um, uh, my talk is is going to be, uh, uh, I guess, about um, half um, uh, diagnosis and half uh, prescription, uh, going with the uh, the two halves uh, of of the title. Um, what is fueling the the rise of, of right-wing populism and, and what can we do about it. Now, as, as um, Diego uh, mentioned, um, just as I speak, uh, the inauguration ceremony of uh, President Biden is taking place. Uh, you know, Trump um, has taken the last trip on uh, Air Force One um, and, and frankly, good riddance. Um, and, and we might think that perhaps the, uh, the national nightmare uh, is is over, uh, but uh, it's I think um, increasingly evident um, to uh, to to analysts uh, that uh, Trump is in, was in in some ways uh, a, a symptom of uh, deeper problems and ongoing trends, and and just because he's disappeared, um, the, the 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 problems uh, for which he stood as a, as a very um, uh, as an important um, uh, to which for which he acted as a syndrome are not going to be uh, going away. We know in the European context, you're of course very well aware uh, that the vote shares of um, populist parties um, ha have been rising now for quite some time um, and, and almost uh, continuously. So we have we have a we have some we have a problem. Um, and, 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 uh, and, and we need uh, to find a solution uh, ultimately to ensure um, that, the, uh, that the, the, uh, we can restore robust, uh, inclusive and uh, democratic uh, institutions that can, that can work for, uh, for, for, um, uh, for society at large. Now, um, I want to um, talk about um, uh, first, start talking about uh, the meaning of populism and I think uh, make a few distinctions there which I want to be important as, as we start um, to, to look for remedies. 
um, I, then I want to focus a little bit about um, uh, uh, what might explain the rise, um, and I, I, I emphasize here the rise uh, uh, or the increase of um, a, a particular brand of populism, especially right-wing populism, uh, um, and, and, and argue essentially that the trigger um, uh, is, has been a variety of uh, largely economic factors uh, acting uh, against the background of cultural and identity divisions, uh, but uh, it's, it's largely the economic shocks that I believe are responsible for the rise, for the increase uh, in, in populism. Um, then I want to hone in what I think is the fundamental economic problem uh, that is confronting our societies that's leading uh, to this kind of, of uh, bad politics. And, and that sort of um, uh, a particular type of inequality that's created from uh, um, Inequal, unequal access to good jobs, or, or what economists call uh, the problem of labor market polarization. Um, and then in the last part um, of um, my, my presentation, I'm going to be uh, proposing some ideas about how we can pursue a, a good jobs uh, uh, agenda um, and, and, dry, and trying to draw a, um, this agenda uh, a little bit more clearly by by drawing these um, contrasts with with the with the sort of traditional welfare state uh, arrangement um, that has worked um, so well in in, in Western Europe. Um, so I, um, I don't want to spend a whole lot of time with regard to defining uh, populism. That's obviously not my comparative advantage as as an as an economist. Um, I think most political scientists would agree that that uh, populism is is a kind of is a style of uh, governance and appealing to people um, that it highlights um, uh, the claim uh, that uh, the populist leaders speak for the people and people are united by a common interest um, and that also sets um, a, an ongoing battle between um, uh, the people and the enemies of the people. Um, and uh, for my purposes, I think what's uh, extremely uh, important in terms of the style of governance of populists uh, is, is a rejection uh, of um, restraints on the use of executive political power. Uh, after all, if um, the elected leader, the populist leader represents the people, uh, it's uh, absurd that the will of the people should be restrained. Um, and therefore, the argument is that um, uh, that there should not be such restraints. Now, uh, that's what uh, makes uh, particular populists uh, so dangerous to um, a, a, a true conception of democracy, because democracy rests not just on elections, but also rests on um, certain other um, institutional constraints on what elected leaders can do, such as a free media, uh, an independent judiciary uh, separation of powers. And those are the restraints that um, uh, populists um, uh, want to get rid of. And that's what that's the deep sense in which they undermine uh, true democracy. So that's the political dimension. Uh, but I think there's also a, an economic dimension of, a, uh, of an aversion to restraints in the domain of economic policy. So typically, um, populists might also want to get rid of restraints on, um, on how they conduct economic policy. And, and the restraints there might be things like you know, independent regulatory agencies and independent central bank or external restraints such as trade rules or trade agreements in the case of the European Union. Uh, the rules of uh, the acquis communautaire, or, or, or you know, sort of you know, common rules on immigration and so forth. Um, so this is obviously a different kind of, of aversion, and and one might argue, and I would argue, it's one that's much less damaging to the spirit of democracy. Um, and in fact, one of my arguments will be that in fact, a part of our solution uh, might be to be much more. Uh, willing to accept um, an aversion to restraints on, on economic policy. But to make my, my point a little bit uh, clearer, perhaps I can just you know, sort of lay out this two by two box where you know, we can discuss about sort of different types of leader or different types of regimes with respect to um, their attitudes toward both economic policy and political restraints. So the, 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 the traditional sort of, you know, the, the archetypal illiberal uh, democracy here, democracy in quotation marks would be, 
a regime like Erdogan's or Putin's or, or a regime that actually uh, uh, Trump uh, would have liked um, to erect um, in, in the United States is where you have simultaneously uh, um, uh, 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 you know, sort of um, rejection of restraints with regard to both uh, the political institutions and, uh, as well as economic policy. Um, now, a different type of populism that one might associate perhaps with Bernie Sanders or Elizabeth Warren or some other left-wing populist uh, parties in Europe might be a kind of a democratic populism where um, uh, there is a rejection, um, a quasi-rejection of restraints on the economic policy front, such as independent economic agencies or trade agreements uh, that constrain what the executive might do in the economic sphere but not in a way that's sort of rejecting um, the, uh, um, the separation of powers or the, the rule of law and independ independence of the judiciary. And we might say that's a different type of populism um, that's sort of a, a purely economic populism uh, that is not so damaging to, um, to, 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 to liberal democracy. Um, now, uh, uh, among sort of, you know, the other two boxes I think are interesting because we don't often uh, talk about them, but. Uh, you know, you can actually imagine a regime uh, such as uh, uh, Pinochet's in Chile, uh, where, you know, essentially there was no, um, uh, there, you know, there was a rejection of, of restraints on the political sphere in the sense that Pinochet was fairly free to do uh, whatever he wanted to do um, in terms of, uh, you know, appointing his own people and controlling the media and so forth, um, appointing his own people to judiciary, but actually, you know, was willing to condone uh, very tight rules on uh, monetary and fiscal policy and, and regulation. So that would be a kind of the authoritarian technocracy. Then we have perhaps a mirror image of this or the liberal technocracy, which many people have claimed the European Union uh, uh, is, uh, where essentially there are a lot of economic constraints, uh, but the constraints are really in the, uh, um, with respect to, um, uh, you know, sort of, they, they extend also to an acceptance of um, uh, political uh, constraints as well. Um, so uh, the, 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 the roots of populism have been, uh, you know, discussed under, you know, under these uh, two, two headings. Um, on the one hand, we have an argument that, that emphasizes economic shocks like globalization, austerity, uh, deterioration uh, in, of income inequalities, the uh, erosion of the middle class. And then we have uh, cultural explanations um, that uh, emphasize broadly a conservative backlash against social liberalism or um, uh, you know, rising nativism and anti-immigrant sentiment, especially in the United States, uh, racism. So how do we think about sort of the relative um, uh, roles of these things? Um, I would begin by um, actually uh, distinguishing between sort of a, the demand side and the supply side of populism. So, you know, the, the question of where is the demand for populism is coming from. And there I would um, emphasize that really what has significantly changed is, are these uh, economic stresses and anxieties that have been driven by a variety of factors, I'll, 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 I'll highlight globalization perhaps, uh, but also there have been other, uh, other factors, uh, technological change, uh, uh, market fundamentals, policies, and so forth, and that these have you know, aggravated uh, divisions in society, and, and, and those divisions are not simply economic divisions, they are spatial divisions, they are social cultural divisions. Now, on the supply side, um, sort of these are sort of, you know, the, the, the stresses, the anxieties um, that um, uh, induce look for, you know, alternatives for uh, groupings, political groupings um, uh, that are not mainstream, but they don't necessarily, these, these uh, grievances don't necessarily uh, come with certain ideologies uh, or with pro programs, and the programs are really provided on the supply side by, by political leaders or political parties. And very crudely speaking, you know, that could take a sort of a right-wing form or left-wing form. So the right-wing narrative uh, would emphasize the role of outsiders, uh, immigrants, um, uh, um, you know, maybe, um, uh, you know, um, uh, so it would take a much more kind of an, a nativist, ethno-nationalist uh, narrative, uh, whereas the left-wing narrative might um, target um, international banks, big corporations, 
uh, you know, austere in fiscal policies, trade deals, and and, and so forth. And um, and if you look across sort of you know you know parties or or political uh, populist groups around Europe and the United States, you know, it's it's. Uh, it's sometimes you have a mixture of these things, um, as I think uh, you know. You, if you're thinking of Italy, you might say, okay, uh, it's actually in many in many instances might be a combination of these things. But it's you know you can imagine sort of you know parties that are more on the on the right wing narrative side and parties that are more on the on the left wing side of that. Um, now, um, I, I think my emphasis on uh, on economic shocks and in particular the role of globalization. Uh, you know, really is, is in some ways actually inspired by the historical experience with populism, because, uh, you know, sort of this is not the first time that we have uh, a populist backlash. In fact, um, the original populists in the United States um, uh, grew out of the uh, grievances of farmers uh, at, in the uh, tail end of the 19th century um, in the U.S., as farmers in the southern and western parts of the country were being squeezed by economic conditions that were, uh, by and large, the outgrowth of the gold standard, you know, the globalization of the day, the hyper globalization of the day. Thanks to the global, thanks to the gold standard, uh, farmers were being squeezed on the one hand by sort of uh, relatively high nominal interest rates and declining uh, world uh, commodity prices, which meant that their real interest rate burden was very high because of the rules of the gold standard, essentially the national government, the federal government couldn't monetize um, and therefore was forced to pursue what today we would call austerity policies, which showed up in these high real interest rate, high debt burdens on the farmers. And you had the People's Party essentially giving voice uh, to these grievances. Uh, it was farmers then and not uh, the middle or the lower middle class or the workers of today. Uh, but, uh, you know, sort of this, this, this very well-known quote from William Jennings Bryan, who was uh, the Democratic candidate for president in 1896, uh, in the speech he gave at the Democratic Convention uh, that year, uh, uttered this famous uh, sentence that says, you shall not crucify mankind upon a cross of gold. Uh, in other words, you should not let the rules of the gold standard, you know, basically suffocate ordinary people. Uh, um, and and the, 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 uh, so the, what was the remedy? The remedy was getting out of gold, allowing uh, the monetization of silver so that the money supply uh, could actually increase. Um, and that was really, in some sense, the beginning of a kind of an ideational switch in that, you know, the populace ultimately did not want, did not win in the United States. But their ideas eventually did. Um, ultimately, it was uh, FDR in 1930, um, in 1933, um, who would uh, get out of the gold standard, um, uh, essentially finishing uh, the program that the U.S. populace had started. For many of the same reasons, uh, the need to uh, essentially um, inflate the economy uh, to to generate, um, you know, sort of increases in incomes for uh, for broad groups of people. Um, you know, why, uh, you know, sort of why does hyperglobalization, um, this is the, you know, the historical experience with the gold standard, but why does hyperglobalization aggravate uh, divisions within society? I think there are essentially, you know, three reasons. One simply has to do with the economics of it, uh, which is uh, that, um, you know, uh, you know, open economies are fantastic for uh, increasing the gains from trade. Uh, on, the, on the other hand, open economies uh, tend to come at the cost of reducing the scope for productive diversification. So if you will, this is the tension between Adam Smith and Friedrich List uh, in the conduct of economic policy. Uh, secondly, there is a, there's a direct uh, distributional conflict, uh, which is that we know that uh, openness uh, to trade and financial flows uh, has uh, important distributional effects. Um, and, uh, and 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 that, that's going to be one um, um, important factor driving um, uh, society apart. And then, you know, ultimately at the level of politics, um, you know, sort of the more integrated you are uh, in the uh, global economy, the less scope you have in terms of choosing your own tax policies, regulatory policies, fiscal policies, and so forth. And the gold standard was a very... Uh, critical illustration of that. 
um, and, and therefore uh, maximizing the gains from trade comes at the cost of, of reducing the scope for policy and, and regulatory diversity. Um, and, and that uh, essentially also has significant distributional effects for those who might be hurt uh, by the inability of um, uh, uh, national politicians to respond to domestic grievances. Now, the, the, uh, the late 19th century US populism uh, was a brand of populism, which by the standards of today, I would have called a kind of a left-wing uh, kind of populism. Today's uh, populism, however, uh, has taken uh, more often than not a kind of a right-wing version um, that emphasizes, uh, you know, sort of, you know, the, the US populists in the late 19th century were opposed to the financial interests, the banks, big banks in New York and, and New England. They were directly targeting the gold standard and globalization per se. Um, uh, I think the, the, the narrative in, in much of today's uh, populist movements um, um, has been much more of a, you know, an, an ethno-nationalist narrative focusing on racial ethnic divisions, uh, focusing on uh, immigrants um, uh, and um, uh, minority, minority groups. Now, does that mean that, you know, that the sources are not uh, similar? That is that it's not, uh, that the demands for populism are not coming from the economic side. Um, I, I, I recently you know, the, did a paper where, which was sort of an extensive review of the literature um, where uh, I tried to focus specifically on sort of these uh, different um, causal channels. And what's interesting is, is how uh, you know, there is a fair number of empirical work that now um, uh, makes it clear for us that uh, the kinds of economic dislocation and anxieties for which globalization shocks are responsible um, have not only direct effect on individual policy preferences, but also have indirect effects that often show up um, in ways that suggest as if uh, the fundamental cause are cultural or attitudinal or have to do with um, uh, attitudes towards you know, racial inequality or social identity. And here I want to emphasize two uh, interesting indirect causal pathways in particular, uh, the one here that's identified by B and D. Um, the one by B is how um, when societies are, 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 are hit with economic shocks, uh, that it becomes um, they, that, that uh, distrust and opposition to outsider groups also tends to increase. So you have an economic shock that reveals itself uh, in, uh, in a deepening uh, cultural or, 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 um, or attitudinal um, uh, attitudes and, and divisions. And a bunch of papers have actually shown how you know, trade shocks or shocks coming from labor market disruption and increasing labor market uh, uh, insecurity um, uh, can drive um, greater aversion uh, towards um, uh, outsider groups or, or, or drive uh, insider versus outsider divisions in cultural terms. Um, so, uh, you know, economic insecurity is, is a driver of these um, cultural divisions in society. That's sort of one indirect channel. Um, the second uh, indirect channel is, is, um, is, is very interesting, which, is, which operates on the supply side of um, uh, 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 politics, which is the, the, uh, the decisions of uh, parties to respond to uh, underlying economic shocks. So here, I think the best argument has been made in the US case by um, uh, in a book, in a recent book by Hacker and Pearson uh, with the interesting title, uh, Let Them Eat Tweets. And the, the, it's really an account of how the Republican party has moved uh, since the 1980s or before actually since the 1970s um, and, and how it's ultimately produced uh, Trump. So the argument is that um, as inequality in the United States increased as the middle class eroded, uh, the kinds of economic policies that the Republicans stood for, um, you know, uh, fewer transfers, less important role for the government, uh, lower taxes, 
In fact, those preferred economic policies moved further and further away uh, from the preferred policies of the median voter because the median voter, the middle class was falling behind. So they actually wanted more help. They wanted more activism. So the economic policies of the Republicans became uh, more um, um, unpopular. And therefore the response of the Republican party or more generally parties of the right was to shift their campaign narrative and the language away from the economic policy programs much more towards a kind of identity policies that that is effectively inflamed racial attitudes um, and ethno-nationalistic attitudes uh, so that's the you know where let them eat tweets comes from so they they feed a, a kind of a story uh, about the the unfairness that results from uh, you know government programs that might favor uh, African Americans or, or, or women or, or minority groups or supposedly immigrants um, to uh, to maintain support uh, on the part of of, of, of the median voter, um, and that supply side channel of inflaming these cultural divisions. Um, is actually driven by you know the, the, the deepening economic inequalities in, 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 in society and the inability of parties of the right uh, to provide um, the appropriate economic responses. So the the the, the appeal moves uh, to an ethno ethno nationalistic and, and, and cultural uh, um, uh, domain. Okay. So I uh, I, I want to now um, uh, move on from the from the diagnosis. Uh, part uh, more uh, to the prescription part. So, what is it uh, that that we need to do? I think from one way to to summarize where we are and and the essential problem uh, to which uh, we actually need a solution to uh, is is with this picture. And this is a phenomenon called uh, in the economics literature is called polarization in the labor market. So, this is what the globalization has contributed to, but also is the product of changes in technology, the rise of the gig economy, uh, and the variety of economic policies that have been pursued in the last few decades. But essentially, uh, it's that the middle of the uh, labor market has collapsed, both in terms of employment, labor demand, and in terms of earnings. So if we divide the labor market into in terms of you know, three categories, the very bottom, that's the lowest skill, the lowest educated, lowest earning uh, um, uh, group. And then sort of the middle, the foundation of the, you know, if you will, the middle class. And then the top earners with the you know, um, highest skills and highest uh, earnings. Um, if we look at sort of, you know, these, uh, um, uh, you know, advanced countries, and this is more or less the same in most countries that I'm aware of in, 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 in the West. Uh, is that essentially is really the middle that's collapsed in terms of both the number of jobs that are available as well as, as incomes. So this in the United States uh, shows up uh, as a significant uh, collapse or decline in the size of the middle class. Um, in, in many other countries where, you know, sort of the inequality has not risen, I think it, 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 it shows up uh, actually uh, in, in terms of the quality of the jobs uh, increasing uh, insider, outsider tensions in labor markets, increasing uh, labor market insecurity, uh, and much greater financial worries uh, in, in general. So, so, um, so this is the problem I think that uh, at the root um, has been uh, has been linked, and I think is critically linked um, uh, with the uh, with the increase in the demand for um, uh, for, for for populism and non mainstream. Uh, forms of political um, uh, 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 parties. And, and that's essentially the problem that we need to find the solution to both for uh, economic inclusion as well as, as healthier polities, okay? So um, we have a situation where, um, you know, sort of, you know, international economic integration alongside technological trends and market fundamentalist policies have produced uh, domestic disintegration. So we, we need, what we need to do uh, is, is pursue an agenda that's going to uh, um, uh, uh, be able to reintegrate society. Um, so to, to jump to the very end, um, uh, I would like to say that I think many of the remedies will look like 
uh, they have a dose of uh, economic populism. Uh, so they might, inc you know, may, might um, involve much greater economic uh, activism on the part of the government, including things like public investment, you know, much greater taxation of corporations, a bunch of industrial and regional policies, uh, lots of employment safeguards, you know, sort of, um, uh, you know, standstills or different types of trade agreements, you know, financial taxes. Um, and I'll, I'll provide my own preferred agenda uh, in a minute, but I think a lot of the remedies will look like uh, they are uh, actually sort of uh, economic populist remedies. Um, and, and the argument here is that, that you know, that, you know, in some ways, to put it my point as starkly as possible, that um, that economic populism of this kind uh, actually uh, may be needed to forestall uh, its much more uh, damaging cousin, the uh, political populism, uh, which is really what undermines um, uh, um, healthy, uh, healthy democracies. And my own uh, preferred agenda uh, is to call sort of good job strategy that is you know filling in that middle of the uh, um, labor market uh, that is at reversing labor market polarization and i want to emphasize how different that is from our sort of conventional uh, welfare state um, uh, arrangements okay so uh, to make uh, this point uh, let me use um, another uh, matrix uh, which i think it's going to be helpful to understand what really uh, I'm, I'm talking about so this matrix um, uh, divides our policies, particularly with respect to inclusion, uh, along two uh, sort of axes. Um, on the one hand, going down the first row, um, uh, we can ask the question, you know, what kind of inequality or what kind of inequality are we targeting? Are we targeting people at the very bottom? So that would be like poverty, anti-poverty policies. Are we targeting the middle class? Or are we talking really about sort of, you know, uh, taxing some of the um, incomes and the wealth of the super rich, uh, the, the income distribution at the top? Um, and then the second axis is the response to the question, where exactly do we intervene? At what stage of the economy do we intervene? Uh, we might intervene sort of what, you know, I would call sort of there, we could, we could do pre-production, production versus post-production kind of interventions. So pre-production, um, and I might as well sort of give you uh, examples of, of these types of policies. So pre-production policies are things um, that essentially uh, try to uh, increase the, the endowments, uh, you know, the health, the education, uh, the networks, the financial assets of households or individuals uh, before they join the labor market, before uh, they become economically active, right? So spending on education, or um, sort of ensuring that intergenerational equity is maintained through inheritance or estate taxes. Uh, those would be all sort of pre-production kinds of, of, of interventions. Um, then we have sort of these post-production uh, that is after employment, investment, production, innovation decisions have been, uh, have been undertaken, then you can un try to undo uh, what markets have produced through post-production policies. So those would be obviously things like tax and transfer schemes uh, that, that to redistribute um, uh, market income. Now, the welfare state model uh, is essentially very much focused on uh, these pre-production and the post-production stages. That is, this, this, the traditional conception of the welfare state model is that you, know, you, know, you invest in education and training um, and uh, to prepare people uh, for, for good jobs. And then you also have in place tax and transfer and social insurance schemes to, to ensure that people don't fall through the cracks um, and uh, people or households or families that confront idiosyncratic risks are taken care of, okay? Now, uh, the limits of the welfare state model from the, from the perspective of labor market polarization uh, is that this this model essentially assumes that you know middle class or good jobs are going to be available to people once you have the appropriate endowments, right? Um, but I think uh, what's going on today is that the kind of labor market inequalities and insecurities and the squeeze on the middle, this labor market polarization phenomenon, is is much more of a, of a structural problem. 
uh, that this inadequacy of good jobs is driven by secular trends having to do with these underlying conditions in, in globalization and, and, and technology. Um, and uh, when the hollowing out of the middle of the employment distribution is due to these structural trends, um, then we're going to have um, a, a kind of a problem of permanent bad jobs and depressed regional labor markets. Uh, and that needs a different strategy that's going to, that, that tackles the creation of good jobs, the supply of good jobs directly. Okay? So the traditional welfare state model does not address uh, that problem. Uh, except indirectly to the extent that we have industrial and regional uh, policies, but I'll, I'll come to that in a second. So in other words, going back to this to this matrix is uh, what I think is, is sort of the, you know, where we need to engage in much more thinking and in much more policy experimentation uh, on is, is really thinking about sort of, you know, production stage interventions, policies that are going to affect directly the employment uh, innovation investment decisions of firms uh, with a view uh, towards getting them to internalize uh, to sort of the social, economic, and political externalities of, of a scarcity of good jobs in, in particularly distressed communities, but the national economy uh, more broadly. Okay? So I don't have a lot of time to go into, into detail about these, you know, sort of what a good jobs strategy uh, might entail. Uh, but uh, just to give you a bit of, a, uh, of, of an idea about what I have in mind, I'll just um, outline this under four headings. Um, I, have, I have some slides that go into the details on some of these things, uh, but uh, I think I'll skip those more detailed slides and, and simply um, uh, just very briefly outline um, uh, these, these four strands. The first trend uh, is a really an extension of our existing uh, active labor market policies or training policies. And I think uh, what these um, policies have to be uh, adjusted uh, in essentially two direct directions. One is uh, to ensure that these active labor market policies or the agencies in, the Euro in Europe, there are the public employment services, that they are much more closely uh, um, engaged with employers to ensure that the, the training uh, uh, services that are provided are linked to the needs of the employers and that in turn, the employers and their human resources uh, and their operational decisions uh, take much more into account the kinds of the, the human resources, the human talent in their own local communities. So that's going to require these uh, public employment services or these uh, active labor market uh, uh, agencies to be much more directly engaged uh, with the decision-making process of the firms and the employers. Now, active labor market policies in some ways in Europe have already moved in this direction, but I think they can go uh, much more. Uh, the second change here is, is really to ensure that it's, you know, these uh, agencies are providing much more sort of what in the U.S. context are called wraparound services to their uh, to the trainees. Uh, so these are these are people who might need, you know, transport. They might need uh, guidance. They might need, you know, sort of, uh, you know, uh, babysitting services. So much more indi indiv individualized services to people who are uh, looking for 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 jobs uh, than uh, what um, these agencies typically do. Uh, so. There, there are, there is uh, good evidence from the U.S. context that's, you know, programs that do that, which are called sectoral employment programs in the United States, actually do work, uh, but they're very limited, and very, uh, very, and, and 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 they need to be scaled up, and there's obviously uh, a lot more experimentation that needs to take to take um, to um, to be done. Now, uh, the second strand is uh, sort of industrial or regional policies that are directly targeting good jobs. Now, uh, European countries uh, and also the United States spend an inordinate amount of money on, um, uh, on trying to direct investment into distressed regions or where employment policy, where employment has lagged. Uh, but they often uh, take the form of tax incentives, um, of subsidies, and most often targeting investment, physical investment, rather than necessarily 
uh, targeting jobs directly, although jobs are supposed to be a, a byproduct of that. So I think what we need to do is, is redirect those policies in a, in a way that are much more uh, um, away from uh, cash handouts and, and, and tax incentives to the provision of much more of sort of um, customized business services uh, to firms, particularly smaller and medium-sized firms, uh, to provide them with the marketing technology business uh, um, uh, um, uh, help uh, that would allow them to expand, but do so in return for you know, soft conditionality with respect to the creation of, of good jobs. So that would be the quid pro quo of um, uh, targeted and, and contextualized, individualized uh, business services, productivity enhancing business services to firms in return for um, uh, undertaking sort of good job, uh, good jobs targets. So that is essentially entails uh, repurposing a lot of the industrial and regional policies uh, that that already exist. Some are already operating in that way, but it's it's really striking how much fiscal resources are spent on on simply uh, giveaways uh, to firms. Third, and this is probably the most um, um, uh, uh, ambitious and and the one where we have the least amount of evidence on what would work, uh, but I think it's incredibly important that. To understand that that technology has a direction, uh, it doesn't fall from the sky uh, on our lap in, in ready-made form, and that just like we can uh, encourage, let's say, green technologies, or we can you know, encourage or invest in military technologies for uh, for um, uh, uh, national defense purposes, we can also uh, direct technological innovation in a much more labor-friendly direction. Um, so I think uh, that means um, looking at our existing tax systems to the extent that they might uh, actually, for example, encourage automation because we tend to subsidize capital um, while we tax labor. Um, looking at sort of you know, the direction that uh, AI could be moving into, uh, that could um, AI uh, systems that could actually augment uh, the capability of less skilled workers on the factory floor or in, in, in services. Um, so these things uh, are happening. We have um, you know, bits and pieces of evidence of that, but I think you know, there is no sort of national governments haven't actually gotten around their mind uh, of, of actually pursuing um, uh, programs that are directly trying to um, uh, to push direction in a, in a sort of in a way that's going to where new technologies are friendly to labor uh, rather than uh, replacing labor. Finally, going back to the argument about globalization now on the remedies, I haven't said anything yet about globalization. And I think that's, that's, that's because I think the role of trade and international financial policies is largely to ensure that there is space for this domestic agenda of uh, producing good jobs. So I don't think you're going to can get good jobs by putting up barriers. You, I don't think you're going to get good jobs simply by taxing international corporations. But if you need to tax international corporations to generate resources for your industrial policies or your um, uh, labor-friendly uh, R&D incentives, then you may want to ensure that you have programs in place that you know, throw some sand in the wheels of international finance or international capital mobility. Similarly, if international trade uh, with low standard countries uh, threaten to undermine your domestic regulations or domestic labor standards and social standards, then I think it's okay to envisage things like uh, anti-social dumping uh, uh, schemes uh, to provide sort of remedies at the domestic level uh, to tax or keep out uh, imports that threaten to undermine domestic labor and, and social uh, social standards. But you know, in order for international or international trade policies that provide protection to work, there has to be something domestically that's worth protecting. Um, and that's why I think I put the I would put this, you know, the emphasis really is very much on the domestic agenda. And our international economic policies have got to be in the service of that uh, domestic agenda. I think that's also one way of reversing, I think, the main mistake that we've made since the 1990s with our approach to hyper-globalization, where increasingly globalization became an end and national economic policies became the means 
So rather than the global economy supporting our domestic uh, economic and social um, 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 prosperity, uh, domestic economic and social arrangements became sort of, you know, how you could be better compete globally. So there was a re re reversal of uh, priorities under, you know, that had prevailed for under the Bretton Woods regime, for example. Um, but it's, it's really mainly a vehicle, it's a means to an end to ensure that your, your, your domestic uh, policies, uh, your domestic programs uh, can, can work. So I, I've already talked uh, for a very long time, as I said, you know, I have some more detail on some of these uh, policies if people are interested in, uh, but I hope it's sort of given you a, a bit of a, of, of, of a hint as to so where my thinking is and where I think we need to do, uh, to do more work in and where I hope uh, sort of, you know, the new administration, the Biden administration in the United States uh, will be uh, also uh, getting engaged in, uh, although whether it does so or not, I think I, I'm not quite sure I can give a definitive answer to. So uh, let, me, let me just stop here and I'll be happy to, uh, to have some comments and, and questions. Hello. Thank you very much, uh, Danny. I hope you can see us. Yes, I can. Yes, okay. We have uh, actually, thank you very much. This was a fascinating lecture, not only because you went deeply into the sources of uh, uh, the understanding of uh, this right-wing populism, uh, but also because you delved a lot with the remedies and the possibility of implementing policies, reducing this kind of social and political stress. And I think it's very interesting what you say that actually, uh, in a way, we need to, to develop a policy agenda that uh, uh, targets the difficulties of the middle classes. No? Very frequently, we think that we associate uh, all this unrest and even right-wing populism uh, to the problems of the people with the, in the lowest brackets of income. But in fact, it's something that is related to middle classes. And it's interesting to see how this implies a quite a strong reversal in the policy agenda because moving from a policies that are essentially welfare policies, purely redistributive policies, to policies that in a way try to enact new investments, new activities, new action, uh, it's a very different uh, target. And also, it's also a domain in which uh, states are not always very good, very well at ease in uh, devising and implementing right policies. It's easier probably for a state to implement, a deal, or at least they have much longer experience in implementing a, a good welfare policy rather than, uh, rather than uh, uh, targeted investments and growth oriented and job oriented policies. That's more difficult. So I have, uh, we have lo a lot of questions here. Uh, I'm, I'm sure, I don't think we can report all of them to, to you, but I would, I would start from a question that uh, it's very interesting and it's about uh, your idea of economic policy restraint. And the question which is by Ricardo Rovelli at the University of Bologna is whether uh, economic policy restraint in itself might have fueled uh, somehow populism and uh, you know, the, the protests of the people. Uh, what he means here is, for example, the idea of having an independent uh, central banks or balanced budget constraints, which are typical in Europe and which were very, very, very obviously in place, for example, during the sovereign debt crisis in Europe, no? How, this somehow this uh, uh, policy, economic policy restraints and the balanced budget uh, rules uh, in the European, uh, of the European Union, the European Commission, limited margins of maneuvers of governments and certainly fueled up a lot of, uh, um, you know, bad feelings and a lot of populism. What do you think about this? Um, I, yes, I think, you know, I think that's right. I think this is uh, closely linked to, to um, sort of the ideas of my uh, political economy trilemma of globalization, which Georgia, you were referring to uh, at the outset. And, and I do think that, um, um, uh, that, that those restraints have served 
to uh, inflame populism and have empowered uh, populist politicians uh, because politicians, those politicians could call the bluff of the, uh, the mainstream parties. Because essentially, so, uh, you know, this is actually, I, I heard this from a, a former uh, finance minister from one of the Eurozone countries after I had you know, presented my trilemma. Um, and, and his response was to say, you know, sort of, uh, you know, the reason he said that populists are winning in Europe is because, you know, they're the ones, the only ones who are actually explicit about your trilemma, that there is a trade-off, that if you are going to, you know, push policymaking powers uh, uh, onto sort of to, to Brussels and to Frankfurt, uh, that yes, that there will be, you know, less room for domestic policy. Whereas mainstream political parties have maintained this illusion or have maintained this mind that they, you know, they could have their cake and eat it too, that there was no sacrifice of sovereignty, there was no sacrifice of policy space. They never owned up to it and they never gave a full accounting to their publics as to A, that this is what they're doing, and B, that this is actually a good thing. This is why we're doing it, because there are some benefits. We'll reap the banes of the single market, we'll reap the gains of you know, monetary and price stability. But you have to be care you have to be also explicit that you're giving something up and you're you are giving uh, some policy auto you're giving up on policy autonomy. And I think uh, that enabled I think uh, the, the, the the populist parties to to actually um, uh, to uh, to to uh, call uh, the mainstream uh, parties bluff on this issue. And I think but the deeper problem uh, is and the one that's really you know, highlighted by my trilemma is that you cannot have this disjuncture in democracies. You cannot have this, you know, this juncture between where policy is made and where politics happens. Uh, I think in what happened in Europe and especially in the Eurozone is that policy increasingly moved uh, to, to Brussels or you know, to Frankfurt uh, while politics became, you know, be, re remained largely national. So, you know, so this divorce between politics and policy is really a recipe for disaster because, you know, all the politics happens at the national level, but national poli poli policy makers, the politicians are essentially unable to respond. The, you know, either they're unable or they prefer to hide behind, uh, you know, European rules. Um, and that creates a fundamental ten tension, which is, in, in, which is incompatible with, with, with healthy uh, polities. That's why I think you know the you know the Europe has this fundamental tension, and, and Brexit, of course, was a, a clear uh, illustration of you know sort of uh, you know this tension and how, in the case of one country, it was resolved by essentially Britain saying no, we want power back, uh, even though paradoxically Britain was one of the European countries that was le least restrained, uh, both because it wasn't part of. Um, the monetary uh, single money, as well as because of all the exemptions it had, uh, uh, it had you know um, uh, uh, been allowed. Uh, but it is a fundamental um, uh, um, structural problem within the Euro European Union that if Europe need, if Europe wants to maintain its democracy, I think either it will have to uh, move more in the direction of political integration, that is, move politics transnationally, or some of its economics will economic policy will have to move back to national capitals. So either more political integration or less economic integration. That's essentially the, 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 you know, the, the point of my trilemma. Um, and, um, and, and I think that's um, a, a problem that the, you know, the, you know, the European Union hasn't fully solved yet. Yeah, but maybe if we're thinking about, sorry, I, I say something on this way, if you're thinking about Europe, uh, the move of policy away from politics, if you want, in Europe, in, in the case, for example, of the recovery fund, okay, where essentially you accept the idea that this is the case, but also there is mutual support among uh, the community of countries, uh, which actually, uh, with an agenda that is really implementing what you were saying, many of the policies that you were saying, is probably different from a situation like we had during the sovereign country, where essentially you move uh, uh, the policy away from politics and you tell politics you are, on, you are on your own and you have to deal with your own problems, even though we set the policy agenda, don't you think? 
So, I mean, I, I, there is in, in the international agreements, there is a way of somehow soothing the problem of moving the policy away from the politics or not. No, I mean, international, you know, European solidarity in the service of, you know, more inclusive and faster recovery from the pandemic is obviously much better than, uh, you know, rigid international rules that would leave each country to its own devices, particularly those that were going through uh, debt crises. But that doesn't solve the fundamental political issue. So I, I, I don't think sort of a, a, a technocratic solution to these crises where a bunch of essentially, you know, technocrats, not part of a thick democratic, uh, um, uh, you know, accountability and deliberation, uh, decide on these rules and then will hand out, you know, sort of, you know, solidarity funds uh, to different nations. Um, you know, I don't think that's going to solve this fundamental problem. It's better than the, you know, the alternative conditional uh, on, on the decisions being made uh, centrally. But we do have, I think we, need, we do need to find, have a solution to the, to the you know, sort of what's called the democratic deficit. And that's going to be there regardless. Yeah, this, this is absolutely true. Uh, now, there is a question on uh, uh, essentially what you, I mean, a, a couple of questions about your idea of good idea of somehow uh, trying to implement policy that reduce, uh, if you want, labor replacing innovations. Okay, first, how can policy somehow intervene in uh, somehow influencing uh, technologies towards a more labor friendly uh, patterns. This is not so obvious and uh, it's not easy to think at policies that could actually do this. And then uh, the other issue is uh, about, uh, and I'm just putting two things together, but I think they're related, is that essentially if you are in, in this frame introducing different labor standards among countries, okay? How can you accept, uh, you know, the, uh, the fact that countries are trading still in a free trade environment with different labor rules and uh, different labor conditions? How, how do you see these things evolving? Yeah, so maybe good, two very good questions. Uh, maybe um, I, will, I will actually, you know, go back, you know, use very quickly, refer to a couple of the slides that I, I have not um, um, to, uh, to, to answer the two of them. So one is on these you know, innovation policies directed towards labor-friendly technologies. So I, I, think, you know, I think the first point to, to appreciate there is that, um, that the existing, that we are already uh, influencing the existing direction of technological change. That is, we're doing it on the one hand by the incentives uh, that, have, that we have built into the system, for example, that we um, you know, tax labor, whereas we subsidize capital, so not a big surprise uh, if we actually induce firms to uh, you know, excessively autom uh, um, you know, install robots and automation. Or for example, you know, a, a big um, uh, you know, sort of director of um, Technological change in the United States is, is DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Administration. But you know, they are mainly interested in defense or defense-related technologies. So, for example, they're much more likely to uh, promote driverless cars um, because you know you don't want to spend, you know, you don't want to send your know, human being to the battlefield. So you want, you know, just simply you know, send uh, you know, stuff and equipment. And that's going to be, you know, then that, you know, sets off the whole automated vehicles industry. Uh, but there was no thinking about sort of what about the labor market or the social consequence of that, because the objective was uh, uh, defense related technologies and to avoid co casualties in the battlefield. Uh, so there are already incentives in place which are biasing the direction of technological change. That's number one. Secondly, there are sort of embedded norms uh, in Silicon Valley um, and in uh, sort of, you know, among innovators uh, about sort of, you know, what type of innovation, you know, sort of uh, you, 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 you engage in. So, you know, great story about Tesla, how, you know, Tesla, you know, sort of invested in excessive automation, having an excessive um, uh, confidence 
uh, that simply having this big um, factory with very few work workers would be effective. And it turns out uh, that it, that didn't work out and then workers had to come back in again into the factory. But the notion was that you want to get rid of labor. There's that, this, this, this ethos uh, that's sort of built in and, and whole sort of, you know, basically the norms uh, that's embedded in Silicon Valley don't internalize the importance of creating uh, good, 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 you know, jobs, let alone good jobs. And, and the third issue is, is one of sort of relative power, um, because I think the type of innovation that's uh, uh, developed and adopted uh, in the workplace also matters a lot about who gets to say, right? Is it the owners? Is it the managers? Or the workers also get to have a say? So I think ch by changing relative bargaining powers of different social uh, actors, you can get um, very big, um, uh, quite uh, different responses. So if we look across the spectrum of different types of, you know, for example, different AI systems can be very effective at encouraging uh, shop floor workers uh, that are not necessarily very skilled using expert systems uh, to uh, respond to real-time information, real-time customer demands uh, to, um, uh, by simply by pushing buttons, uh, uh, develop much more customized products uh, and, and, and you don't need to be very, you know, if, if that's the kinds of skills we're investing in, or that's the kind of AI we're investing in, it's going to largely, you know, you know help the less skilled uh, um, uh, blue collar workers rather than the professional workers. Now that is happening, but we're not doing anything to necessarily encourage it more than what is happening. Or you can encourage, you know, AI systems that help less skilled medical professionals or less skilled teachers uh, to perform the jobs of, you know, much more skilled workers or much more experienced teachers. Uh, again, it's 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 a direction of technological change, and 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 we can, uh, uh, you know, we can undertake policies that's going to move it in there. Again, I mean, we need to try a whole bunch of things because, as I said in my comments, this is not an area where we have a lot of uh, evidence-based uh, uh, knowledge, and but that doesn't mean that we really shouldn't shouldn't try because I think it's it's really fundamental. Now on, on, uh, on sort of on, on labor market competition, I would say that I'm actually a proponent of uh, you know, a social anti-dumping clause. Uh, so we, we protect our companies uh, from international competition when uh, foreign companies are subsidized by their governments or they you know, engage in uh, selling below price across the border. We're discussing today how we should, you know, if Europe or other countries engage in serious decarbonization policies, how we should protect those policies by having, you know, border tax adjustments so that, you know, uh, companies, firms in other countries uh, we don't, that don't have uh, those uh, decarbonization policies don't undercut or undermine those corporations. Well, it's, it's, it's the principle exactly the same that I think, you know, that we should prevent workers in, uh, in countries with high labor or social standards from being, uh, uh, from being uh, uh, adversely affected simply on the basis of competition that is based on uh, you know, sort of violation of forced labor convention or the use of child labor or egregious um, uh, violation of labor rights. Now, having set, stated that principle, that, you know, it just opens up the whole question of how you would actually go about designing a process like that. And I've written about this uh, in, in a number of different places, but I think we have models such as the agreement on safeguards, the anti-dumping agreements, the current um, discussion on carbon border tax adjustments. Uh, I think we can learn from those things and apply the, the similar kind of approach or logic uh, to the protection of, of, of labor and social standards as well. Thank you. Danny, <clears throat> there, is a, there is a short question from Carlo Penco, which I'm going to read out to you. It says, were Trump's policies good for protecting domestic, social, and labor standards? And if so, why did they work in, re did they didn't work in reducing populism and had an opposite effect? Uh, I don't think Trump's, I think Trump um, talked a populist talk on the economic uh, um, uh, dimension, but he was not an, econ an economic populist. I mean, he, 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 you know, he lowered taxes on the rich. 
Um, he um, loosened uh, regulations. He you know, did nothing to improve uh, labor standards and labor regulations. The only part of his economic policy that one might have called populist is, is, is you know, trade policies. But that was really a very, that was, that was used in a very blunt way to simply you know, basically hit you know, China uh, over the head with a stick. But if you look at whether those policies actually on balance created uh, employment or helped workers um, in, in the United States, I think the evidence on that is, is, not, uh, is not very encouraging. So, uh, so Trump on the, was not an, ec an economic populist, uh, even though he sold himself as one. Yes. Thank you. Well, the problem is that, as you say, it's really to define uh, the, what is the boundary between uh, good uh, pseudo-populist uh, economic policies, which you define as uh, populist economic policies, and really uh, bad economic policies or bad economic discourse. And uh, it's really difficult to find, you know, a, 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 to think at a, a new policy patterns where actually states can uh, internalize the agenda that you listed and uh, would have the capacity to really implement those policies without fall falling into uh, real populist uh, positions that would not be very constructive. No, don't you think? I think it's... Yeah, I mean, ab no, absolutely. But that's, I mean, that's the, that's a challenge inherent in all economic policy. I mean, I think there's a, there's a, temp there's a tendency of economists for example, when I talk about industrial policies or re you know, redirecting innovation policies or more, you know, uh, uh, you know, more investment uh, by you know, local governments in, in sectoral employment and training programs that, that somehow, you know, policy then will be captured by insiders and that, you know, there's this, you know, you know, this, you know, hand waving political economy argument about how the moment the government does something in this particular direction that it's going to be, you know, uh, filling up the pockets of insiders and lobbies. You know, as if the counterfactual is that, you know, the government, you know, will just basically, you know, pursue a kind of a, uh, a platonic, uh, you know, will be a kind of a platonic guardian uh, that is, you know, simply, you know, maximizing the social welfare function of this fashion of technocratic economists. You know, I mean, we've seen this very clearly in the, in the domain of trade. So a lot of, you know, since the 1990s, a lot of what passed off as free trade or free trade agreements was really just, you know, pursuing the agenda of international corporations, big tech, uh, you know, big pharma, um, uh, and, 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 and multinational corporations. Um, and, and the economists were really blithe to this. They, they said, oh, a trade agreement. There was not a trade agreement they saw that they didn't like because it's like, oh, okay, you know, that's free trade. We're always moving. And that was, it was true that probably up until the 1990s that, you know, you know, these trade agreements were freeing up trade and to some extent, you know, uh, you know the, 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 the lobbies of international corporations was moving us in the right direction. The protectionists were domestic labor and, and, and domestic, you know, uncompetitive businesses. But after the 1990s, you know, it was the export protectionists that got the, uh, the, the upper hand. So it's not like, you know, the, you know, so we ended up, you know, the economists ended up being, you know, un, unwittingly, they became the allies of, you know, a bunch of mercantilists and export protectionists um, mm -hmm. who, could, you know, who could legitimize what they wanted uh, by appealing to sort of the support that they were getting from, from the economists. Right. It's a very complicated and controversial issue, but certainly we need new recipes. And I think your work, Danny, really helps a lot in understanding and uh, pushing forward the debate on what really we should do in this very difficult moment. So I think uh, we reached an end of our lecture uh, and also our the discussion. I'm sorry, there were a lot of questions that were put on the Q&A folder, but we cannot uh, deal with all of them. I think anyway, Professor Roderick was really generous in the responses he gave us on the few questions we could put up to him and in his presentation. So Danny, we, the only thing that is left is that uh, we keep, uh, we will keep insisting of having you here as soon as we get over with this difficult moment. 
I really hope we, we will be able to walk around in Turin and in Italy with you soon. Okay, and thank you really very, very much to be with us tonight and to enlighten us with all your good ideas and interesting studies. Thank you. Thank you thank very you. much. Thank you. It was, it was, it was, it was great. Um, I, I, there's nothing more I would like than to be living in a world where visiting, uh, you know, being there is actually a realistic possibility. Okay, let's try to make it through as soon as possible. Yes. Bye. Thank, thank you. you.